Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. I come to another Eid. Uh, I don't feel right unless I speak on the Eid, so you have a work day ahead of you. I'm going to make it as brief as I can, real, very brief. But I want to also frame the understanding of the retreat. I want to go back a little in time. Uh, you know, of course, we know uh, that over 1.4 billion people who call themselves Muslims in this world uh, were sacrificing uh, or celebrating this, the feast of the Eid al Adha, the feast of sacrifice, <coughs> and Eid al Hajj. We had the benefit of hearing. Sheikh Nuruddin, if you want to know more about the hearing, if you want to know more about what we're saying about hearing, I gave a whole id talk on this a number of years ago on the significance of the dream, the ruhiya, and, and a lot more detail actually than he went into yesterday. Uh, and if you're interested, if you're very interested in knowing more about that ruhiya, and uh, you can look at that former khutbah. <clears throat> this attempt of Sidney Ibrahim alayhi salam uh, to sacrifice Ismail uh, has a lot of meaning as we know and Muslim scholars have been teaching that Allah inspired Ibrahim alayhi salam to sacrifice his son uh, by slaughtering him with a knife and uh, of course this idea as we know especially today is an extremely horrific idea and we see in the world today how it's being manifest by people who uh, who uh, uh, take this concept of slaughter to the worst possible inhumane way it could be taken Add to that the idea that of, of a add to that the idea of a father sacrificing a child, uh, and it makes it even even more horrific. The story obviously has a lot of significance because it's found in the Torah and it's found in the Quran, <clears throat> and the idea of killing relatives is even found in the Bhagavad Gita, you know, of uh, the Hindus when uh, Arjun asks Krishna, you know, how he tells him how he feels about killing his cousins and his uncles on the battlefield, Kurukshetra. There must be something in it. There must be some reason why we have to contemplate this horrific crime or apparent crime. Bible taught that Abraham Salam, was ordered by God to sacrifice his only son Isaac, which of course is contradictory to the Bible itself, uh, because uh, even in the Bible it tells us of Hadar and Ismael, and also teaches that Isaac was not, uh, I mean, so he was not his only son, and there are these many scholarly commentaries on all of this, which I'm not going to bother with, and you can indulge yourself if, if you want to, with if you want to. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we know, never advocates evil, always tells us that compassion is greater and good overcomes evil. He never commands what is shameful. He says, do you say of Allah that he knew not? Allah commands justice, the doing good and liberality to kith and kin, and he forbids all shameful deeds and injustice and rebellion. So he, uh, so he, so you have this contrast contrasting statement. He says, commands justice, doing good, and liberality of kith and kin. Could just end there, but he doesn't. And, which links it together, says, as a conjunction, he forbids all shameful deeds and injustice and rebellion. So he put these two things opposite each other. So now there has to be a proof of that. What's the proof of it? And although it was indicated to Ibrahim alayhi salam to sacrifice his son because he believed in a dream in this ruya and he verified it over three nights of the same 
Ruhya, same dream or vision, and I've gone into the derivation of that term in other discourses too, we knew from the Arabic that the dream came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala and it was verified. So he didn't, he, he hesitated, and then we know that his son says, you know, basically, okay, pop, do what you got to do. Because you're, I'm a honey, I'm a believer. I'm a, and you're a believer. And no word in the Quran is chosen by accident, and nothing left out. Because Ibrahim alayhi salam knew that the dream was for Allah, he proceeded to try to do this, and three things are accomplished at this event. Of course, we know that Allah saves his son and put a lamb to be sacrificed instead. He dulled the knife, just as a safeguard, just in case, you know. He was swift, maybe. And the sacred relationship between the father and the son was preserved. And so we see the relevance of the former quotations of the Quran that Allah never asks what's shameful, never asks what's unjust. But three things are accomplished from this. Also, the test of Ibrahim and his son, Ismail, is the first. The proof that Allah never condones shameful deeds is the second. And we'll tell you the third in a second, in a minute. Oh, he says, okay, I saw this in a dream. What do you think? He said, oh, Father, do what you're commanded to do. You will find me, uh, you'll find me, Allah willing, Allah willing, patient. And we call him, O oh, Ibrahim, you believed in a dream. We have thus rewarded the righteous. That was an exciting test, I think, huh? We ransomed Ismail by substituting an animal sacrifice. We preserved his history for subsequent generations. Peace be upon Ibrahim and righteousness. <coughs> because we know that what comes from Ibrahim is this long line. Well, we're, we're standing here, right? And the third part, and the third part, then is the most difficult part for us. Then it requires that we find the Abrahamic and the Ibrahimic. Uh, the, the, you know, the Abrahamic, the Ibrahimic, if you want to call it the Ibrahimic, and the Ismailic place within ourselves. And to do that, we have to understand something which is perhaps a little disconcerting and perhaps something seems a little fatalistic that is simply this. I'm going to say it simply and I'll and then I'll speak a little about it. Life is about sacrifice. Life is about sacrifice. It's also about perpetuity and sustainability. Family line, or tarika, if you want to say, or deen, if you want to say. It's about sustainability. Because we know for one thing, for sure, that all life does not stop when our life stops, right? And it's obvious that we all have made sacrifices and newsflash, we're gonna have to do more, we have to make more in life. Even this little boy, and these little girls. The third part then is the most difficult part and it requires that we find this place within ourselves where we can make that statement to our Father, to our Creator, to our Lord. And yet, the word korban implies something else. It implies kinsmen. So, hold this meaning in your mind as I just go on for a few more minutes and then I'll stop and you go to work. All meanings in Arabic apply to the story and specific ones apply to specific aspects of this event. The event of taking the knife, slaughtering is one word. The idea that it's a kinsman is another word. The word for generalized concept of slaughtering for halal meat is another word. All these things are important. And if we're going to eat things that are halal, then we should expect that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to accept the halal sacrifice 
If you're going to eat things, well, no, obviously, I'm not talking about eating the slaughtering of a son. I'm talking about the concept of what is purified, what is halal, what is done in the right way. And so it's an approach. How do you do what you're going to do? How are you going to do the work you're going to do when you leave here today? <clears throat> Very informal. It is here for us. You're all dressed in your work clothes. You're all going to go to work. You're sacrificing some time. You want to do it in a halal way. You want to, you're working with your brothers and your sisters. Hopefully you think of each other that way. Your aunties and your uncles. Your kinsfolk. Your kinfolk. Because you can't say your kinfolk is just your bloodline because every one of you come from a mother and a father who are not related by blood. <laughs> I think. Well, some of you married your cousins. Well, as Muslims, we should understand that we're talking about always in sacrifice something that is either near and dear to us or something that is going to sustain us, like in the, eating the korban, the lamb, or the sheep, or the camel, or whatever sacrifice. So it is near and dear to us. And even if you remember the story of when I was in a Palestinian, when I was in the Palestinian village, and we were at uh, Dr. Amun's house, alhamdulillah, I remember his name. Uh, we were Dr. at Dr. Amun's house. I uh, hope, inshallah, he's still alive and well. Uh, and. Uh, they brought the they brought the goat out uh, the, the sheep out I mean to to be slaughtered, and of course this was a sheep that came as a baby to the house and the little children loved it and was like a pet and they were sitting with it and petting it and everything and the next second they were watching it get slaughtered, you know. And that it, and I had mentioned to him and I told him you know isn't it hard for the children because now it's a pet, it's like how many of you are cats. I know you don't have dogs. So how many of you have cats? Raise your hands, okay? Okay. It's okay. You can hold your hand up for more than a second. Okay. <laughs> Won't kill you. Okay. Over three quarters of the place have cats. So I'm going to say, okay, go home and slaughter your cat. It's a horrible thought. And think about these terrible, terrible criminals, what they're doing in Iraq and Syria, calling themselves Muslim. So we understand that everyone is a brother and sister on some level, and we understand that the relationship between ourselves and the Prophet Muhammad is another aspect of a near relationship, and we understand that the relationship between ourselves and our sheikh is another family relationship, and when we look at nature and the lives of animals and all, life is a process of striving and of submission and of trust. Meow, meow, meow. <laughs> Go feed the cat, the cat's hungry. Cat's hungry. Jahan's cross-eyed cat couldn't catch anything if it was standing, on his, uh, standing in front of it. <laughs> Poor cat's cross-eyed, seeing double, everything double. Can you imagine spending your life seeing two Jahans every day? <laughs> they couldn't catch anything. It was standing on its nose. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. Feed the cat. Go we'll feed the cat. I go over to our fish pond. I say, fish, 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 the fish comes swimming over. Let's get fed. They're goldfish and koi, so we're not going to eat them. So, why do we find it difficult to understand our place in this process of sacrificing our individual selfish nature to the very, very same objectives? Certainly, the contemplating of the quality of consciousness, that unique self-centered characteristic that we all share as human beings, should help us to understand. But it doesn't, however, explain the inner urge in all good and normal human beings to create something better. Just because we're conscious doesn't explain that. Because look at these people who are thematically conscious and look at the horrible acts they're committing. Conscious in the sense of awake, conscious in the sense of being able to know what's happening in the next minute. I don't know what it means, it's consciousness. I spent many years trying to understand consciousness. 
better opportunities, better work, better insights, better physical surroundings for ourselves or our offspring and for future generations to come are things we all want. And why? Because this, the understanding of this lies in accepting the positive, inspiring aspect of self, of selflessness, of selflessness, of sacrifice. What are you willing to do to make things better? For yourself, for your family, for your parents, for your children, for your community, for your nation, for your world. And if you can link all those things together, don't you think it's sort of like creating a larger magnetic pull, like wrapping wire around a piece of wire of iron? That's the love of our kin, the love of our fellow beings. And that's the empowerment and preparing ourselves for life of worship. Accepting this immediate, complete relationship with our destiny. In other words, our life is about sacrifice. Sacrifice for the good, for the good of following generations. And our consciousness, hopefully, good consciousness, allows us to improve the circumstances of this world. And one that is a clear world, a purpose that shows all the role that others have, that we have in that world, is very important. But only when that consciousness is part of worship, part of obedience, part of submission, part of trust, part of selflessness, all of those things are hard for human beings. You would think they come naturally. They're part of our nature, but they have to be brought out. And we can all identify with the difficulty of it. How to trust when to trust is challenged, how to be obedient when not thinking that you're being oppressed and submit, how to be selfless as opposed to selfish when you have needs, how to be patient, how to be happy, how to how to convey <coughs> gratitude every moment of the day. Are you conveying gratitude this moment? This moment. Can you look to yourself and ask yourself, are you creating gratitude? Are you conveying gratitude this moment while I'm speaking? It can be to me, it can be to the concepts, it can be to being where you are, it can be whatever you are you conveying that. If not, what's the time of day you're supposed to convey that? Under what circumstances are you going to convey it? What's going to remind you to convey it? When you get something you want? Well, then that's not really selflessness. Is it at 2.05 every day? Set your alarm clock just to remember to be grateful? When? Maybe in the middle of your sleep you have a ruhya, a dream, or a vision. Do you know what I'm saying? Are you ready? Are you poised? Is it possible you can be grateful most of the time? A lot of the time? All the time? I know, it's very cyclical. hard to understand, but not about living for ourselves or our selfish interests. Of course, that's valid to some degree. We continue to strive to maximize our potential. We try to learn more. We try to be creative. We try to do good. We, we, we live for a future world that's better. Oh, that's all, that's all part, of, part of it if it's done in the right context. And so the qualities of obedience and submission and The lives of the Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam and Ismail alayhi salam and <coughs> Prophet Muhammad alayhi salam and Aisha alayhi salam and others are the models for our relationship with Allah. But we have to find that place inside of ourselves, and it's difficult for us to decondition ourselves from our old ideas and fantasies about life and thinking in a very materialistic, personal, career-oriented, selfless, selfish way that somehow all this plan for us is other than perpetuating and striving toward knowledge, other than sustaining our community here, other than focusing on our faith and the worship of him in our actions and hearts, but indeed it's what it's all about. Those are the models, those are the means, those are the examples, those are the tools, those are the catalytic elements that, that make, that put the two aspects of the, uh, of the chemical reaction together so you get the chemical reaction. 
that's the that's the um, that's the way that the immune system fights off the bacteria and the disease. It's what it's about. It's building up the immune system on one hand, creating the right elements for the catalytic conversion. And this is what we've been told about since the beginning of time. Every generation has the opportunity to live in harmony and create and to build upon the previous generation's work and to meet tests that come and that finally, if passed, liberate us from the sense of distance and loneliness from the Creator. And yet each generation tends to miss that opportunity by transferring the ultimate goal to something worldly and something temporary. And we're very good at that. And that's not to say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not provide us with appreciation to his creation, of course. Plenty of boaters, hunters, fishermen and women, flyers, avionics, photographers, painters. The world's full of people who appreciate nature. Alhamdulillah, it means there's some life still in somebody's heart. But I have to tell you, I can't see, I can't comprehend that one of these killers in the name of Islam was going to go home after beheading two or three people or machine gunning 20 people on a road and sit down and paint a nice pretty picture. I, I can't, I, I can't see that. You have to put me in an insane asylum if that's what happens. Because cruelty kills the heart. You can't see the beauty of Allah, then you are not a Muslim. There's no ihsan. And the tests come. And each generation tends to miss that opportunity to transfer the ultimate goal to something worldly, even though it's temporary. And that's, and so we have, we're part of this greater consciousness that separates human being from the rest of creation, and we enable us to improve the conditions of others. Or what, who are we? Who are we? What's our pattern? Birds migrate. Fish migrate. Whales, mammals migrate. And people migrate. It's used, the term is used in the Quran. And I don't mean just physically migrate. <coughs> Consciousness. And every one of those benefits, the sweetness of love, the feeling of fulfillment, the joy of work, each one have its tests and its trials that come along with them. Each demands an attitude of submission and of trust and of faith and of obedience to live and to struggle or to thrive in the conditions and situations we're placed in or which we have chosen apparently for ourselves. These are the basis of our tests and our trials. Think about all our brothers and sisters now, our relatives in Iraq, in Syria, Nigeria, all these places where this misery is happening. And still you say submission and trust and faith to thrive in the midst of difficulty? Yeah. Yeah. Aren't we all surprised when we hear stories about the people in the refugee camps or the people who survive under the worst circumstances? Don't we, don't we say, I couldn't do that? Alhamdulillah, it's not me. I wouldn't survive that. Don't we think those kinds of thoughts? Living in a tent with 17 people in a tent where mud is everywhere and there's no food and there's disease all around you, and where do you go to the bathroom? You know everybody has to use the bathroom, right? When there's no bathroom? It's a blessing to thrive in the conditions that you and I live in. It's a blessing to do the work you're going to walk out of here in the next few minutes and do. It's a blessing for all of us to be able to sit in a room that's either air-conditioned when it's hot and heated when it's cold and comfortable on the floor in a place where there's a carpet where people would never sat on a carpet in their life. And yet, we all have tests and trials. The pawpaw trees gave fruit this year, a lot of fruit this year. They survived the winter. They go down by the stream where it gets very cold in the wintertime. They love it. It's a cold winter, we had more pawpaws. How do we know what the tests and the trials of nature really do to us? What kind of fruits that they bear? 
unless we do our practice, unless we have faith and believe, unless we trust in our elders. But let me can present a good thesis again, that we're born to sacrifice with our Allah-given life, that we might fulfill our pledge, our word, to sustain and to preserve his creation and to do it in a way that becomes clear opportunity for each of us to come nearer and nearer and feel the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and get over the loneliness of separation for future generations to thrive and to be fulfilled in their responsibility to preserve and to sustain creation and do exactly the same thing that over and over again but for some kind of a cyclical prog progress. And so we have to have a very realistic and positive view about our tests and our trials and about the opportunities in our lives and the experiences and the many ways of worshiping our Creator and our Sustainer, inshallah. And so here in our community, we're not insulated or isolated from tests and trials, as we well know, not from the conditioning, not from the apprehension of sacrifice, but it has to be clear that Allah's intention is not our suffering or our loss, but the opportunity to those things give us to excel in our duty, to develop skill that can be useful to refine our submission, to create safety and security for the future. In other words, simply and clearly stated, we have to live for the future by worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala consciously and purposely and by living and focusing our efforts today for today and tomorrow. And it's our duty and it's our obligation to be obedient, to sustain the clarity and the purpose and the truth. This is Islam. This is the true Islam. This is the Islam of the real Ummah. And to put our energy into the fruit like the tree, like the papa tree, preparing the environment properly or clarifying the roles of the seeker and the guide and the worship and the worshiper and the means and the wasila. And so whether we're thinking about the zibah for the slaughtering of Adam or the korban to approach near or the, you know, and, uh, or the, or the uzhiyah or whatever these words are that are used, each one with a specific meaning we have to return in our journey back to the origin of its meaning. Inshallah, I hope. And the root of that, or shall I say, it's a table with four legs or six legs, whatever need we need in the moment. One of the form, one of the found, founding legs of the form of four strong legs of the table is Adam. And that's what we'll be talking about, inshallah, I hope, if Allah gives me life and energy next weekend. As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Eid al-Mubarak. Eid al-Mubarak. We all have work to do.